Thank you, Christian. I'm really glad that Kitty agreed to do this briefing for us because um, I didn't really know anything about aflatoxins or mycotoxins. And uh, when I came back to the World Bank from WFP, Kitty was actually on the convent with the World Bank. And so we overlapped only for about a month. Um, but I heard about this and I went to talk to Kitty and she thoroughly got me convinced this is a big factor in stunting and it's something that we in the ag community really need to do something about. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Kitty to the platform to do this briefing and then the subsequent one which will look at more of the solutions because I think it's something that we as a community need to come together around and address. So I'll keep it short and hand it over to Kitty. And uh, the floor is yours, Kitty. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you to the Secretariat. I, I think this is a great platform. I was telling Christian before that this is a very needed thing in the world, and this is a great way to do it. So I'll start just by saying that a lot of what I present will be work that I did and my team did in Africa, but since then, and that was in the 1990s and uh, late 1990s, uh, since then, there's been a great deal of corroborating research, and this is a little bit technical. But if it, you know, if you don't understand something, we'll certainly uh, clarify. I started uh, this research, and I, I, I was working on aflatoxin as a plant pathologist with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in um, Nigeria in West Africa. I also had a lab in Benin. And when I arrived to Africa, there was an offer, at that time it was called GIZ, to do some research that would look into aflatoxin and maize. I was a plant pathologist. Plant pathologists deal with fungi. I worked in maize. And so I was asked to look into and see if there was a lot of trouble with aflatoxin in the maize. And when I started looking into it, um, what well, well what we found was extremely alarming, extremely high levels of aflatoxin. And in, in addition to that, apl um, maize was being, it was one of the primary complementary foods, one of the foods that babies are weaned to. And so we began to ask the question, as a plant pathologist, I had to ask the question, well, is this harming the babies? And we, need, we felt that we needed to, uh, to, to get an answer to that. Gigi, is that continued to be extremely important. Uh, they, they supported the research all the way through, as well as the governments of Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, Canada, the US, um, the US Ag Research Service, and the USDA, and the Foreign Ag Service were also supportive. And also, we had a large grant with uh, Rotary International, which is more of the social side of, of this problem. So with that, I'll start on what we have learned. You gotta love Wikipedia. This is this is directly from there, and I thought it was just great. It even gives the origin of the roots. So, what are mycotoxins? Mycus is fungus, and of course, toxin is poison. So, mycotoxins are tech, are toxic secondary metabolites. In other words, it's something that the fungus just makes as part of its living process. It 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 has an accumulation of of these secondary chemicals that don't really have much to do with the way the fungus grows. And the fungi, these are what you, know, you normally we would call molds, right? That's what we, when we see it, we go, oh, God, that corn is moldy, or the bread is moldy. Anyway, the term mycotoxin is usually reserved for, um, uh, specifically for fungi that are creating toxins in, in food crops. Aflatoxin is one of the main ones. This is the one we'll hear about the most. It has, these are spore heads. These are all spores. This is what it looks like in, under the microscope, and this is what it looks like on a corn grain. It also contaminates rice. We've recently found an, a study uh, in, uh, looking at the literature in China that there have been um, intoxications of aflatoxin in rice. Ground nuts are very susceptible, almost all tree nuts, and you'll find this all, everywhere in the world, including in the Middle East where tree nuts are grown. That, that there's a problem with uh, the nuts becoming aflatoxic. It's also known to be in spices, and, and particularly in chili peppers. And this is something that hopefully we won't end up regulating because everybody likes their spices. You can find it in yams, coffee, chocolate, and all kinds of other things. 
It also gets into oils that are pressed out of, of uh, ground nuts and maize. So if you look at the structure of this thing, see how it has all these closed rings, these, these hexagonal rings and these closed rings? This is a very stable substance. It is, it's very hard to break these rings open. And part of the reason that this to toxin is toxic is because it, the body can't break it down. It stays as it is as it moves, as it moves through the body. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. There's another, uh, there's another uh, mycotoxin called humanosin. It's a little bit less understood, but we know that it co-occurs with aflatoxin in maize almost, uh, almost everywhere. And it, it, new evidence is coming out that it probably potentiates the effects of aflatoxin. So you see how these toxins are named. They're named by the, by the, the this is the Latin binomial that describes the fun that that is the name of the fungus. So this fungus is called Fusarium maniliforme. The other one is called Aspergillus flavus. So Afla is the aflatoxin, and Fumon is Fumonisin is the name of this toxin. It is only primarily maize and sorghum. It's pink looking rather than green. If you ever see pink stuff on moldy maize, you don't want to eat it. It's also associated with esophageal cancers in uh, South Africa where they make beer out of moldy maize. And um, it also, we know for sure that it kills horses. It causes a, a horse uh, encephalopathy where the, the horse's brains uh, deteriorate. Oh, one last thing about this slide. How open this structure is as compared to the aflatoxin, which is a little bit more closed. This indicates, although it's still very toxic, it, it indicates it's a little bit easier to pull apart through processes such as cooking um, and fermenting than the aflatoxin is. So it's a, it, there, there may be more things that we can do with this at the, at the processing level uh, than the aflatoxin. So from now on, we'll be talking primarily about aflatoxins, but do remember that fumonisin typically is in there as well in a lot of places. So you can see the green stuff on uh, corn, peanuts, yams. These are yams that are dried in the markets in Africa. Um, they become very toxic. So a lot of different commodities are affected. There's a lot of exposure. And, and, I'm talking about Africa here, but I'm telling you this is not just Africa. It's all over the world. And particularly, if you look at places where there's a lot of stunting, you're going you're gonna to find that there's exposure risk there. <clears throat> the levels and a frequency of occurrence. Now, this is in Africa again, but we, I, and I, I don't know that anybody's been too systematic about looking in other parts like South Asia and Southeast Asia. In Africa, up to 30% of the stores have greater than 20 parts per billion of aflatoxin. Part per billion, 20 parts per billion is a codex standard for the world. There are a lot of, a lot of different allowances. Europe only allows four parts per billion. The US allows 20 parts per billion, except if it's for children, if it's gonna go to children, it can, only, it can be zero parts per billion. So th those of us who regulate aflatoxin, the allowances are quite low. So if we saw up to 30% of the stores, more than 30% of the stores with 20 parts per billion, and 90% of the stores have the fungus, and that's important because contamination with the toxin can continue to occur from the time that it's in the field all the way until consumption. So any time along the chain, the value chain, during transport, storage, even in the household, where it's where the fungus is exposed to water or or moisture or insect feeding, that toxin continues to grow while the fungus is there. And we noted also that up to 40% of the grain in the households have toxin in them. That's a lot of exposure, and this is this this is probably the tip of the iceberg. It's also a huge concern for food and feed processors. There are a lot of animals that are also very sensitive. Chickens are extremely sensitive. Pigs are sensitive. And so people who make foods like Mars and Nestle's, uh, Nestle and the grocery folks know about aflatoxin. It's a big problem for them because they, 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 they're responsible to make sure that it's not in the food that they process. Um, emergency food aid, 
typically World Food Aid, World Food Program, tend to have problems sourcing locally because of aflatoxins. And school feeding programs and ready-to-eat uh, therapeutic foods, uh, the RUTFs, also have a real big problem sourcing locally to find uh, non or uncontaminated uh, source foods. And the things that cause the, the, the risk factors, in some places you have extremely highly toxic strains. I know, for example, in Kenya, the deaths that have occurred there due to aflatoxin, it's because they have very highly toxic strains. But in conducive environmental conditions occur in almost all tropical and subtropical areas. As a matter of fact, we had a huge outbreak of aflatoxin in Ohio last year during the drought. Traditional farming methods and improper grain drying, you notice this is everybody, if you've ever been to Africa, you've seen this. This is drying grains on the side of the road. And look, here's the rain coming in the background. You can see the rainstorm for that afternoon coming. So how does, how does the fungus get into the food? It's a, it's a ubiquitous soil-borne fungus. It means, I mean, everywhere in the world you're going to find this fungus in the soil. And while the crop is growing, air, it, it, it triggers this to release its spores. It produces its spores. The same conditions that help the crop grow help the fungus grow. So it releases the spores, and the spores are taken onto the silk of the corn, and they run down through the silk or and or transported by insects into the ear and then bore into the kernels. So if one thing that's unusual about this particular fungus is that in this case, it's not just moisture. Drought stress is one of the biggest risk factors. It, it tends to cause damage to the pericarp, to the surface of the grain that allows the fungus to get in faster and better. Very high temperatures, even if it's not drought, but very high temperatures also predispose. And we know it, with climate, uh, climate change, we're, we're likely to see more and more of those conditions around the world. And of course, then the harvest management practices all the way through to consumption give the opportunity to, for the fungus to continue to make its toxins. So let's go back into risk a little bit. There, we, we know that there is frequent and chronic exposure to aflatoxin in sub-Saharan Africa. If you look at the open literature, you'll find that that's true in China as well. Um, I don't have as good of information right now about South Asia and Southeast Asia, although we found some uh, reports in uh, Vietnam, again, on rice. I know the Middle East has problems, and particularly on, on, on nut crops, but they have uh, exposure risks there. And then uh, Central and South America also have exposure risks. So does the... So does the North. And in the United States, Europe, everybody has exposure risks. But in countries where the regulatory system works, um, it tends to keep the levels low in foods that actually make it to the consumer. It's common and at high levels in staple foods in a lot of places. Exposure begins in utero and continues throughout the life of the individual. And aflatoxin, particularly, is cumulative in the body. As you eat it, each day it accumulates. It gets caught in the liver and it accumulates. The public health impacts, the, well, I mentioned a little bit some deaths. Like acute exposure kills you. It, it causes immediate hepatic failure. It looks like an acute hepatitis and it causes death. And there are reports from China, India. Kenya has them very regularly where 100 people or so and all the domestic animals in the in a village will die because they've gotten too much aflatoxin in a corn. But beyond acute exposure is chronic exposure. And this is, this is probably the most common. The reason that aflatoxin is regulated is because it's a primary liver cancer causer, a hepatocarcinogen. And if you, there's hepatitis B in the picture, it gives you up, you're very likely to get liver cancer if you have both of these things together. Even without hep B, you're, it still increases risk of liver cancer. So this is why we, in the, regu, in the, in the, in the developed world, uh, regulate this. New information, however, helps us understand that in addition to being a liver cancer causer, it's immune suppressive. It exacerbates the pre-5 uh, morbidity, and 
it is associated now in the in the scientific literature with making HIV more lethal, more infections, more opportunistic infections that the body can't fight off because the aflatoxin is also causing immune suppression of some in some way. We also know, and what we're going to get to now, is that exposure in young children is associated with impaired growth and development. And this is the first thousand day problem. If they're being weaned within the first thousand days and used using our, uh, complementary foods that are mycotoxin rich, aflatoxin rich, uh, the chances that they are that they will have uh, growth faltering. So, uh, more into the growth faltering business. It's also associated with low birth rates. I just saw some papers in Saudi Arabia proving this in Saudi Arabia that mothers that are exposed to aflatoxin during pregnancy give birth to significantly lower weight babies. Those of you who understand the developmental phases and the development of children understand that the low birth weight tends to lead to, to lower ability to grow. All right, so now we're talking West Africa again, and this is from data from my studies and those of Turner and Wild et al. Um, 30 so 45% of the children in West Africa have stunted growth. But we also know that they're stunting in Guatemala, they're stunting in India, they're stunting in Southeast Asia. So chances are that we're, we're seeing a, a, a large exposure globally. Undernutrition and growth faltering is an underlying cause of 50% of the deaths in children. So this pre-5 mortality is very much tied to these things. Um, growth faltering is not fully explained by dietary insufficiency. In other words, the, it, it is not tied to the socioeconomic status of a household. Diet, dietary insufficiency is when there's not enough food or not enough food of, of, of appropriate quality. But only about 50% of stunting is explained by dietary insufficiency. This is a study that, that concluded with that. And Childhood stunting is significant from a public health standpoint. Uh, it's associated with increased vulnerability to disease and, again, higher mortality risk. It's also associated with cognitive impairment, impairment, which is a risk that goes beyond childhood and throughout the life of the individual. So how do we know about this and how bad is it really? How did we figure this out? Uh, studies from all over the world are coming to the same conclusion. Aflatoxin exposure is causing low birth weights in preg from pregnant mothers who are exposed and stunting in children in the first uh, thousand days of life. Cause is, we have to, I, I should be careful with that cause. It is associated with. We don't understand the mechanism. There's some theories that are being tested now. But we know that there's a very strong association with stunting. So before we get into the how we know the science part, I'll just quickly give you some definitions. You'll hear me talk about aflatoxin albumin adduct. Albumin is a blood protein, and aflatoxins bind to it. So when we measure, when we're going in to measure how much uh, aflatoxin is in a person, we, we draw a blood and, and capture the albumin. We can capture the protein through, well, scientific methods anyway. And and then we measure how much aflatoxin is attached to it. It's a highly robust assay. This is well validated in the scientific community and, and, and believed to be uh, absolutely accurate. Uh, so we'll be talking about um, the aflatoxin albumin content in picograms per milligram. These, again, are parts per billion in, in blood. Another de definition, and it, those of you who are nutritionists, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, we know that Z-score is uh, a measure, a, a relative measure of nutritional status based on uh, anthropometric uh, measurement metrics. Uh, height and weight are the main ones. They're very easy to get. They're very easy to train people to do accurately, and and they're and they're very indicative. And so the Z-scores are standardized, and they're age and sex-specific growth with means a, a mean a world mean basically. But when you talk about Z scores within a country, you can also you'll also see a range within a country um, uh, uh, compared to uh, the, the international means. So height for age, 
weight for age, weight for height, and then body mass index of four age is are all Z scores. Z scores then are what we look at to uh, determine whether or not children are growing uh, in a normal pace. Um, very quickly, these two studies, Gong et al., these were studies that, that I organized with uh, uh, funds from GTZ and uh, the Dutch and the Belgians. These longitudinal studies with, uh, in, with Turner um, are in the Gambia, and uh, this, I believe, is also Gambia. Cross-sectional data, cross-sectional means that you're taking measures in a single point in time on individuals. So you're finding out what's happening in a, in a population at any given time. In that study, we found uh, significant stunting associated with the uh, albumin, uh, aflatoxin albumin levels in blood. There was a dose-dependent relationship. The lower it was, the less stunting. The higher it was, the more stunting. Longitudinal studies, however, are more like cohort studies that are follow the same individuals over time or follow, uh, follow populations over time. So we did another study that took children from one to three years of age and, again, found the same thing. Growth, velo growth velocity, in other words, how, how rapidly the rate they were growing significantly, was significantly negatively associated with albumin aflatoxin in the blood of these children. Again, a dose-dependent relationship. And two more studies, and I've seen new ones since, that are showing the same thing. This p-value is a probability of being wrong. So you can see that this probability is low, very low. This is considered highly significant to see these probabilities in statistics. So this is what it looks like. This is from the study that we did in uh, uh, Benin and Togo. And as the aflatoxin albumin, so we drew bloods from the infants and the babies and did their measurements, you know, did the, 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 the anthropometrics. And here's the blood levels. And here's the height for age and weight for age, these two bar graphs. So this blue is the strongest deviation from from the mean, that minus three z-score is significant stunting. And so as the aflatoxin moves, as the blood aflatoxin increases, the, the stunting also increases, and the weight for age, so low, underweight and stunted children. The stunting, the, the, the height for age is the, by far the most significant uh, loss of, of uh, uh, vigor. Same thing, now we're looking at it just in a slightly different way. This is now looking at the picograms per milligram of aflatoxin, and this is the height increase. So this is over time now. Now this is one where we're looking at a cohort. We're looking at the same children um, in three periods over eight months. And this is, so this is the growth rate. And so as, as the aflatoxin amounts in the blood in, uh, are higher, the growth rate slows significantly. Another thing that, that we discovered during this study is that while infants were, were breastfeeding, they were less exposed. And of course, this is logical because if they're being, if they're being, uh, if the complementary foods and if they're being weaned onto maize or groundnuts or any other um, contaminated crop, they're going to get a, 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 a more of an impact once they're weaned. This is a good uh, public health message here. And you can see again now, remember I told you that aflatoxin is cumulative in the blood. So this is, this is indicating what's starting to happen as they're, as they're getting weaned. These children, of course, are younger, for some of them are anyway. And uh, over time, once they become fully weaned, they're starting to get really full uh, exposure. And so imagine children that are weaned early, a second child comes along or for whatever reason, they have to be weaned quickly. Um, the exposure levels start go mounting up very quickly then early on, particularly in the first thousand days. This will re result in uh, uh, lo loss of growth. This is the same picture. Just This shows that after you get up to a certain level of aflatoxin, that, then the, the height for age z-score just plummets up to a certain level, you're fine. So this, this shows us that, that
that the regulatory system is right in saying that we can have some small amount, but once you get past that amount, you're going to have a, a pretty significant impact on kids. And I don't know in this point what the law uh, uh, transformation is, so I can't speak to exactly what is the right amount. I think most people believe that for children, you probably shouldn't have any in the food. Same, just same story for weight now. So that's the picture. That's how we how we came to understand that if aflatoxin isn't causing stunting, it's doing something that's causing stunting. Uh, right now, we believe that it's um, the theory is that it's causing enteropathy. It's causing um, the guts to not work. But it could also be um, that the liver is not functioning properly. The other thing is because it's immune suppressive, children at right at weaning are the most susceptible to um, infections and things as well because their immune systems are, are just starting to be competent. And so if, if there's any delay in competence, in development of competence in an immune system, that child is very vulnerable. So it could be that secondary or other infections are actually causing the growth faltering, but the reason that they are being infected and the infections are having that impact is aflatoxin. So we don't know. But we know that there's a strong association and we need to get it out of the foods, particularly weaning foods, complementary foods. So intervention options, since the problem starts in the field in agriculture, we've got best management practices that we understand. There's a very, very good uh, control solution right now. There's a biological control that's extremely effective. Um, it's being scaled up right now in Africa. The scale, scaling up is not hard. Creating an economic demand in a po population that doesn't know about it is kind of hard. Um, so that we'll talk about that more in another another webinar where we actually talk about the the interventions and what we might do at the household level. Awareness would give us an opportunity to give some food prep messages, um, also to to um, focus on 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 the weaning status of children and make sure that un people understand that. Um, the, the cleanest foods have to go to the babies when they're at, when, as complementary foods. There's some in the evidence that if you eat broccoli, it, it pulls out aflatoxin. And there are clays that if you put them in the diet, they will also um, adhere. They'll, they'll chelate the, the aflatoxin and pass it through. Uh, there are issues with all of these things, availability, sustainability. Post-harvest interventions at the community level um, are likely to be the most effective because you can talk about storage systems and and management systems um, based on community education. But in order to get a long-term sustainable solution, the governments are going to have to be able to put some pressure, monitor and put some pressure on the markets so that, that aflatoxin and mycotoxins are discouraged in the marketplace. I just want to give a quick plug. There is a, an international partnership forming for global food safety. The GFSP is a multi-donor partnership with the World Bank right now as is, is the secretariat. The GFSP has decided to take on mycotoxins, aflatoxin actually in the first case, as a major food safety challenge. It is a food safety challenge globally. It's probably one of the most ubiquitous uh, problems in 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 a lot of in in a lot of the world, and so there's a call for uh, donors to coordinate the activities that they're already doing in this in this uh, realm around the the GFSP and other global global food safety issues, but particularly this one right now is is about to ramp up. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Um, that was great. I mean, 
it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, Cornelius was talking about his age earlier and, you know, mm. I'm up there too. Um, you know, for me, it almost feels like agriculture's dirty little secret, you know, something I've been in the business for a long time and really didn't know much about until very recently, and particularly its impacts on nutrition. I mean, you'd mentioned that, you know, there was an outbreak in Ohio. You know, I live in the States. I have never, ever seen anything anywhere in the world about this when there's an outbreak. Um, it seems like, you know, it's all kept under the, the table. So I actually think it's great that this is now coming out and being more public. And I think from a platform perspective, it's something that we would be very happy to collaborate on, which is probably an abuse of my chair's role, but, you know, to vote everybody else in. But uh, there's not many people to disagree today. That is, Cornelio. Thanks very much, Kitty, for the, for the very informative and, and well-prepared presentation. I heard about aflatoxin and, and, and stunting quite a number of years ago when I was working for WFP in Bhutan. Uh, but I was not aware that it is being accumulated, actually, in, in the body. And yeah. uh, do, do I understand it right that uh, with broccoli, you, you can drain it to a certain degree or... Or how, how is this broccoli uh, aspect? I have only recently heard about broccoli, so I don't know. It was told to me by science. So it's not very scientific, okay? But there may be uh, uh, food and dietary combinations that could mm -hmm. make this work. But we also know that that diversity of diet makes it better anyway. If you're not, if the staple food is not the only food that's being eaten, then you have less exposure. Are there actually handheld instruments uh, in order to, to analyze grains, the, the amount of aflatoxin is on, on the surface, or, or are we there also at a at a early development stage of this kind of instrument to detect it? I understand that WFP is actually assisting within the P4P program farmers quite substantially in, uh, in uh, actually, yeah, I guess, minimizing the, the aflatoxin content. Yeah, this is a good point. Um, I, I don't think that we have anything that's cheap enough. We, what we, we do have, all you have to do is kind of smash the grain, like with a hammer or something, mm -hmm. and, and run it into a buffer, a, a, a solution. And yes, there are, there are strip tests available. They're not real cheap. Ideally, we would get it so that, that you know, they would be pennies. Uh, on the dollar, so that people could use a lot of them. So there's still research in that. Uh, there, there are tests available. We could use the cheaper ones. You said it is not cheap. Uh, is there any development? Uh, are your uh, institute working on this? Well, the private sector works on it. I was just at an aflatoxin meeting for the USDA, and I did not see. Uh, what I saw was people getting more and more technical using, you know, mass spectrometry and things like that. And I that doesn't that doesn't help us in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, the private the private sector has some tests. Again, they're not they're not very inexpensive. They're probably uh, five or eight dollars a test. I think it's sort of interesting because you know it makes sense that the private sector currently has the tests because that's yeah. where the value is. I mean, they actually need to do the protection. And but I think the, you know, the interesting thing is now the proof that this is a public health problem. I mean, once it becomes a nutrition problem, and it's a huge it's issue awesome. for stunting and growth, and it's a public health problem, which means we should be also looking for public good solutions. And it seems to me that maybe we're behind the curve in looking for the public good solutions to this. That's an interesting thought. I mean, some people have tried, and it's been tested, to do a clay additive. Um, I Personally, I have, a, and it works. I mean, if you put clay in a food, it will bind the aflatoxin and take it out. I have a little bit of a problem with that in that it also may chelate other nutrients. It may chelate minerals and pull those as well. And And so we don't use it. We don't it, we don't have any kind of uh, allowance for that here, so I don't know that we should try to push that forward somewhere else either. I'd rather get into the biocontrol and eliminate it at the source 
So, but here's our problem: it's an agricultural problem with a public health outcome. Yeah, that that's that's a conundrum. It's it's hard to create the demand that makes it worthwhile for the farmer to change what they're doing. Yeah. So that I mean, to me, that means we have to move it. You know, some of the work a little over into the public health side of the business and into the the nutrition side of the business. I mean, you talked about the new global food safety partnership, which I know is working on the sort of biocontrols and the agricultural side. But are they actually working on the testing side as well? Well, so what the partnership does is it accumulates. It it tries it. And this is very early. Uh, we're, it's not really doing it yet. The plan is to dr find out who in the world is doing various parts of this and, and to coordinate uh, what is going on. Now, there's always going to be a call for better, cheaper field tests. There's always going to be that call, whether private sector does it or, it or public scientific sector does it. doesn't really matter to me. We need those. Do you know whether the Bill <laughs> Melinda Gates Foundation are funding this, this research on, on testing equipment as well? Recently, I, I learned when I attended a meeting in, in Frankfurt with the Ashoka Fellows yeah, that the Bill Melinda Gates uh, Foundation are funding, I'm not sure it was a university in, in the States, I'm not sure whether it was New York University or something like this, uh, testing equipment. Well, yeah, it could be. I, I know they're funding a very large push for the biological control uh, in Africa. They may be also funding. They may also be funding research into a test. There are good tests available. It's just unfortunately they're too expensive. Now, if 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 we wanted to promote subsidies of those tests for governments, then that's a different thing, and scale. Which biological measures are being adapted right now to control aflatoxin? Is it being sprayed on the crop? I'm going to do another seminar in a couple of weeks about this topic, so you'll get a more, you know, I'll give you more information <laughs> okay. about it. It's, 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 an, it's another seminar altogether. But you use the same fungus, mm -hmm. and they're, they're members of the population of this fungus that don't produce any toxins. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're inundating the the field with non-toxic versions of the same fungus. Mm -hmm. So it's a displacement technology. I want to go back to what Lynn said for a minute, though. Um, the 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 nutrition community, when you're when you're when you're a lot of nutrition is awareness and training at the household level and training on food preparation methods and training. So this definitely should be taken on by the nutrition community from the perspective, if you want to reduce stunting and have stunting as your metric of success for improving nutrition, you're going to have to deal with the aflatoxin issue because aflatoxin yeah. is part of it. And so if you're, if you're going in like through the GFSP to create educational method educational programs modules you want to you want to look at breastfeeding and and you want to look at making sure that mothers understand that the very best foods have to be kept aside for the complementary foods for babies there are ways to clean up grain even if you don't know for sure that it's clean uh, there are things they can do it's not going to completely eliminate it and it may not eliminate it at all, but that awareness is going to be really, really key. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's sort of it's interesting. We have this big sort of multi-sectoral movement now, and particularly on agriculture and nutrition. But I mean, I'm somebody who actually sits in both camps. You know, sometimes I'm with the nutritionist, and sometimes I'm with the ag. And I mean, you know, in the nutrition, this is really not being discussed. And so I think it's sort of it's how we start to ratchet up attention. And I can think of a couple of sort of platforms in a sense where we need to get this better discussed. I mean, one would be the Sun platform right. because, I mean, David's very keen that this is multisectoral. I mean, I, I'm always concerned that in Sun, the people who come to the table, the representatives of all our agencies are from nutrition and not from agriculture. So that limits, I think, some of the agricultural dialogue. 
Um, so I think one thing is we target Sun and David to try and get this um, ratcheted up. I think the other one to target would be, say, the new platform that DFID has set up, this agriculture and nutrition panel of not high-level experts, but high-profile people to try and discuss messages related to ag and nutrition. So if we can feed it through their secretariat and then get some of these people to raise it at higher levels. But I think we, you know, we just have to get it elevated into like the discussion space to push people to be doing more about it. Her microphone is not working, so she wrote the question to me and I will just read it out. Uh, she would like to know if there is aflatoxin in mother's milk and if duration of lactation changes the amounts of aflatoxin absorbed by the child, and then uh, does it appear in goat or cow milk? Excellent question. Uh, there is a type of aflatoxin in mother's milk. It's called aflatoxin M1. The one that we have found associated with stunting, however, is aflatoxin B which is what is directly in maize or peanuts. So we're not seeing, we're not seeing mother's milk as a source of trouble here. Um, there, but yes, there is aflatoxin in it. So, you know, this whole business of the mother being exposed as well, and a lot of the mothers have low BMI as well, low, low body mass index. And, and so if they're being exposed, their milk is going to have it in it. Um, and then, of course, as they start introducing complementary foods, then the kids are really getting it. So, yeah, there, in, in environments where there's a lot of aflatoxin, even the milk is not great. But it's better than weaning on to complementary foods that are highly toxic. Now, the, it, yes, it gets into cow's milk. And I, I don't know about goats, but I know about cow's milk. It, it tends to um, live in the fatty or oil portions of foods. It likes oil crops. It likes seeds that are like nuts that, have, that are oilier. And the aflatoxin tends to be in the, in the fat part. So... Probably would be in goats too, but for in the United States, for example, uh, feeds that go to dairy cattle, those feeds have a zero tolerance, a very very low tolerance, because th those feeds are going to end up affecting the milk. And as I said earlier, the 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 tolerance for aflatoxin in ch foods that are going to be eaten primarily by children. Um, we consider it very, it needs to be almost zero if possible. So yeah, milk, milk needs to be clean as well. I mean, as a follow-up, Kitty, um, you know, when you think in, um, say, poor families who have chickens, for example, and probably feed, you know, what's left over as bad maize and stuff that they reject for the household to their chickens, um, does that, is it cumulative in chickens so that when they eat the chickens or the eggs even, that they get it that way anyway? That is a question. I, I know it affects chickens in that they grow, uh, they, it keeps, it makes them be smaller and they're, they also are affected in the same way. The liver is where the, the uh, toxin tends to accumulate. So I don't know whether the, the livers are being eat, eaten. I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer of the flow through of aflatoxin through through meats or eggs. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, we'd actually advocate eating the livers usually because it, they're nutrient dense. So, um, you know, actually one of the things we're going to advocate doing is probably the worst thing we could actually advocate. So, but yeah, Afghanistan, and that's what I was recommending. <laughs> yeah, if there's a lot of aflatoxin, those livers are not going to be. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a lot of advocacy for peanuts as a complementary food because it's it, it's it's yeah. protein dense, but peanuts are almost always going to be contaminated. And as a matter of fact, yeah. in a certain part of Africa, we found that the higher the socioeconomic status, the higher the blood aflatoxin levels, 
and we discovered it was because through discretionary income they were buying peanut snacks and that was giving higher exposure so yeah we yeah no i have to revise my uh, afghanistan sort of advice because i sort of suggested they're going to grow more almonds and things and processing them into nut butter so small children could eat them now i'm going to have to like add a caveat you know take care of the aflatoxins <coughs> before you do it um does anyone have any other questions cecile just uh, wrote me another question uh, asked okay. kitty if she knows if a study has been conducted about the level intake of aflatoxin in rural and urban areas in the country or a region? Now, there are quite a number of studies that look at uh, distribution. Where um, We know that farm families are, are directly affected because they eat what they grow. We're talking now in Africa, for example, uh, where, where they're consuming as their primary foods what they grow. And they'll often sell the better looking stuff to the cities. However, by the time the maize is moved in the value chain and sits in a storehouse in the city, in the markets, in the urban markets, those markets, the, the maize is just as bad. I mean, it's the same maize, and it may even get worse because it's sitting in storage. So um, and we, we found that the, the kinds of foods that are sold by street vendors in parts of Africa are, are, are highly toxic, things like peanut butter, that are bought in cities and, 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 and uh, brought home for children are highly toxic because they're using poor or quality peanuts because they can blend it up and it doesn't look like it. It doesn't look bad. So city, urban, urban and rural alike are being impacted. Well, Kitty, I want to say thank you. Um, I think this seminar was as powerful as my conversations with you at the bank at a seminar that you gave at the bank, um, which is why I wanted to bring it in through the platform. I have to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you for joining. It was a small group, but it was a quality group, guys. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. <laughs>